Secondary students might be more difficult to keep engaged when they're actually in an activity. So multiple means of engagement focuses on that component. We have to think about what we're going to do to keep our students engaged. Maybe we provided them multiple means of representation like we saw in the last video, but now how do we keep them engaged? How do we keep them moving through it? How do we keep them growing? And what are the alternatives that we have for them? You know, do we have alternative opportunities to engage in the work? Or are we, is our expectation that, well, this person's always done it this way, and so that is the only way we possibly can do it. We have to really question ourselves and think about how we're providing multiple means of engagement. So learners have significant ways in which they differ to be motivated to learn. I think you guys, if you've ever worked with secondary age, middle school, secondary age students, you totally understand that. Um, there are way different ways and it is kind of a, a very large spectrum of some people are engaged just because they love learning. Some people are not engaged at all and we have to do many things to get them there. So within this, their CAST identifies three guidelines that we have to focus and plan on. The first is recruiting interest. We need to spark excitement and curiosity amongst our students. We have to make sure that they get excited and that they want to learn. We have to sustain effort and persistence. So especially when you're talking math or you're talking reading a long novel, maybe they're not interested in it, but we have to get them to a point and provide them resources to help them sustain the effort and persist through it. We also have to help them on the third component, which is self-regulation. Do we have varied seating in the classroom? How do we get students to harness their emotions and be motivated to learn. We have to think about all of these things. And then we have to design some activities that are gonna help them get there. Authentic activities are critical in doing this for many of our learners. Many of our learners might be kinesthetic learners and they might need hands-on authentic experiences. In addition, it goes with the whole processing component that we talked about in the last video. We've gotta make sure that we are communicating to real audiences and reflect a purpose that is clear to them. We have to tell our students our objectives. In a universally designed system, every student knows exactly what the expectations are. We have to vary our background noise, visual stimulation, how we offer things. That clock up in the corner might be really irritating for someone and it might distract them. So we have to think about all those things. Maybe we are not impacted by light or we're not impacted by noise, but we have to kind of think in a universal way about how we can change that classroom or that setting. If we have a student that uh, maybe has a sensitivity to smells, we may not have them go work in a perfume shop. We want to universally design their system for success and for a productive struggle but not one that they can't overcome. So we have to think about how we can support them. We have to think about how we vary the pace of work, the length of the sessions, the availability of breaks or timeouts. We have to provide tasks that allow for active participation, exploration, ex experimentation. I think this is probably one of the largest struggles that I supported students with is that they weren't engaged in the learning and they, they really didn't feel like they could do the hands-on and they had to sit and take notes. And not every student is a note taker. Sometimes they don't have the auditory skills to be able to do that. So we have to provide hands-on experimentation type activities to give those authentic experiences. We have to have strong routines. Many of our students might need a routine. We have to have schedules for work. We have to have schedules when we're going out in the community because many students need to know what's coming next. We have to have alerts and previews that help learners anticipate and prepare for changes. For many of our students verified on the autism spectrum, this is critical to the success and whether it's going to be the difference between a productive struggle or whether it's going to be the difference between never coming back to a location ever again. Because sometimes, especially with students with anxiety, they may associate that location to something that 
a failure or something that didn't go well that last time. So we want to make sure that we prepare them and we help them anticipate. It doesn't mean that we only take them to places where they're going to be successful. We have to help them anticipate that there might be challenges ahead. We have to prompt them and require learners to explicitly formulate or restate goals. So this means that we need them to keep telling us what their purpose is so that they stay actively engaged. We need to display our goals in multiple ways. So we may have three goals that we're working on in the workplace, but we've got to make sure that they have them in front of them and that it's very clear. We need to make sure that we give them scaffolding and tools to get to success. And we have to give them prompting, reminders, guidance, rubrics, and checklists to help gauge their learning. If we do a lot of self-determination within that, where they do self-evaluation, then they are engaged and they have more ownership over the task. Key ways that we can do that is through chunking. And we're gonna look at a few examples to help us understand how we can engage them through this process. The first example that I'm going to give you is chunking reading. When we're talking about classroom and academic success, which is a transition skill, because we have to graduate in order to get to our life's goals, we talk about chunking of our reading, or we talk about chunking. And that seems to always be an accommodation, but I don't know if we really fully understand that there's a process to it. So the resource that I have for you is to talk about, notice step one is preparation. Just like with UDL, it has to be intentional and we have to be prepared. Step two is reviewing reading strategies. So just like with the writing strategies of Kansas, do you review them with the students before they even engage in the activity? Step three is chunking the text, means break it down into smaller parts. Whatever that means for you or for that student, whether it's cutting it apart, whether it's highlighting it different colors, just allowing them to take in small bits at a time. Then step four, paraphrase meaning. So if we think about that, look at that paraphrasing strategy that you're taught through the Kansas methods. In that paraphrasing strategy, could you use it in step four? Step five is assessment and sharing. So chunking assignments isn't just as simple as, oh, here's a piece and here's a piece. It really is about looking at the material and moving into the step process. That is very similar for writing. Now for Kansas writing, what you're gonna notice is it's kind of similar. So one thing that I always provided, I had a student who really struggled with essays and the classroom was not universally designed for him. He would he would know 100% of the material on the history test. But then when it came to the essay, it wasn't the information he didn't know, it was the process. And so I would chunk the writing for him for essays. And this is an example of the sheet I would put with his assignment and he started to write the essays because when it was broken into smaller components, he was engaged. But when he took the whole assignment, it it stressed him out and he didn't know how to prepare it. And so by chunking this information, he was able to express himself. And this is in any class it has use. And then when we talk about chunking math, or we talk about using concrete representational abstract methods, we often forget that students need that step-by-step -step process. If you think about that representation piece, they're taught math in a step-by-step -step process, but we don't always engage them in a step-by-step -step process. And so this concrete representational abstract card provides visuals, it provides steps, explicit teaching steps, and it gives them a reminder. And so by providing something like this to students, it isn't cheating, it isn't anything else other than a universally designed classroom. And every student might need this reminder. It absolutely is not just for students with disabilities. But we have to remember that we have to offer different models of presentation as well. And so when we talk about it, we might need to give them to stay engaged, video modeling. We created a video modeling library um, within our service unit 
because we want teachers to have access to that material. And we worked with Dr. Ryan Kellums on that. And we basically have activities across all things transition. It's really surprising when you look, there's auto, there's making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, there's writing an essay. There's everything that you possibly could imagine that students need. And it's not just students with disabilities. That's why it's universally designed because many of us, when our car is broken, we go to the internet and we look at how to fix it. So we often will go to video models. The Prezi example, it's another really good one of keeping them engaged because when they get to click to get to the new concept, we're keeping them engaged and they want to see what's there. And another really good resource is providing students guided notes. A lot of teachers don't necessarily provide them, but I wanted to show you an example of how it helps. So if you're doing a lecture in a course that you have, students will miss, some students will miss a lot of information because they are not an auditory learner. But when they have visual guides or they have a graphic organizer or they have a step process, they have no problem taking notes or they have no problem gathering the information because you essentially review it by putting some of the components there. So using guided notes, is something that will be incredibly helpful as students go through. There are a lot of resources out there um, that teachers can use or that you can use to help teachers that don't necessarily have to be created because a lot of people think it takes a lot of time. But having a universally designed classroom just takes having to know where the resources are. Actually, So I wanted to show you this particular site for history, say that you needed to review something with students or you were teaching a history class. You can go to the guided notes. So everybody does them very differently, but notice that these teachers are providing them for every learner in the classroom. And so every student has an equitable access to gathering the instructional materials and the information. And so this is incredibly helpful, even for reading. So those are the methods for multiple means of engagement that I'm offering you in this video. We will look at the final component of universal design for learning in the next video, which will be on multiple means of expression.